Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken who just brought our final part of Resolve for More Transforming Stewardship. Welcome, Pastor Ken. Thanks. This has been such a great series, and I love how we've moved from how we read the Bible yeah. and how we uh, steward, pray, pray steward. and give and our money, and now we've really moved into the why. why. Um, and so this week we talked about the why being that we are all stewards of God's money. Yeah. Um, everything that He is, we have, it's yeah. because He gave it to us. Yeah. Um, and so you talked about a parable, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that you were going to kind of give us a little bit more history the and yeah, some more of the it's parable. Really interesting. So scholars point out in the commentaries that arguably more than any other parable th that Jesus told, where you you're sure that he was preaching relevant stories that people could relate to, but you know they could relate to this one. Because 30 years prior to his telling this story, mm -hmm. um, you had a situation where Herod the Great, you remember Herod the Great's the one who had the baby boys killed who are mm -hmm. age two and under, when right when Jesus was born. born. So he dies and he leaves the kingdom to his three sons. Mm -hmm. So you've got Herod Antipas, uh, Herod Philip, and Archelaus. And Archelaus is the one to whom he bequeathed the region of Judea. That's mm -hmm. where Jesus is gonna do his ministry. And, <clears throat> but the interesting thing about um, the succession of leaders in those days in the Roman world was that just because Herod left his region to those three sons didn't mean it was ratified yet. So they would take over at his death, but then sometime in the next, in the first year, each of them would have to take a trip to Rome to meet with Caesar Augustus, who would ratify and officialize that leader's kingship. Okay. The interesting thing about Archelaus is that they didn't, the people did not like him. And so they sent a, a group of 50 emissaries who, who go and they're trying to get to Caesar Augustus and say, do not make this guy our king. Do not make this guy our king. And um, so Caesar Augustus kind of has a compromise and he says, well, okay, you're not the most popular guy, so I'm not gonna make you the king, but you will be the ruler, but I'm not gonna call you king. And we'll just stay in touch and we'll just kind of see how this goes. Well, he came back and what do you think he did to the people who didn't like him? Oh. Yeah, exactly. And um, so it's interesting that Jesus, right there in that region, knows instantly when he, t a, a, a nobleman went off to become a king, mm -hmm. they're instantly going, I know this story. Mm -hmm. But of course he's gonna give it new meaning mm -hmm. because this time, um, he is the nobleman, he's gonna go off, he's gonna to go to heaven, he's gonna come back, he's gonna be the king. Um, and on the one hand, he's gonna be so gracious. Mm -hmm. He's gonna entrust the people. So this is where the, the story pulls away from uh, the history. He's gonna show a lot of grace and um, favor to everybody and leave the Minas in their charge and, and this sort of thing, take care of them and feed them and everything while they're gone, but we also know from plenty of other places, there's gonna be a day, in, uh, a day of accounting. Mm -hmm. And for those who always said, I don't care one whit about Jesus. I don't wanna have a Lord. I don't need a savior. I'm my own person. We know that person's headed into a Christless eternity. And mm -hmm. so in that regard, the parable is, is very literal. It's like, okay. Okay, it's interesting that you say that because we did have a question that comes in that says, if the king is Jesus, mm. then how do we reconcile the harshness mm. that we see? Yeah, well, so uh, I think the reality that we have to look at throughout the gospels is that all of us deserve harshness. Mm. 
all of us deserve consequence and, and uh, judgment and damnation and all because why? All of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of God's glory and everything. But for those of us uh, who would, he's offered a way that we might receive grace and that we might be saved so that we don't have to be judged for our sins and uh, our uh, consequences and all. So um, in that regard, the, the coin has two sides. Mm -hmm. Sure, he'll be, he's going to be harsh to the person who never chose him as Lord, who never chose him as king, who never took him as savior, but he's incredibly gracious, graceful to those who say, no, I'm with you and I'm going to follow you. Good. Okay, so whenever we talk about stewardship, we talk about uh, generosity, there's always a question that comes in that I think is a common struggle for people. Um, when your spouse is not on the same page yeah. with you, it says uh, we are married on earth, but when we get to heaven, we're not. Yeah, right. And so how do we reconcile when maybe we're not on the same page sure. as our spouse as to how much to give or what to give? Sure. Well, I think uh, the, the scripture that you referenced is absolutely relevant, but, but not so much relevant here and now, <laughs> because that's going to be relevant when we get there. Mm -hmm. We won't take uh, or be taken in marriage on that side um, of heaven. But on this side, we are. Mm -hmm. And... So I always, with this type of question, think back to uh, the letter that Peter wrote to the Christians, to the early church. Remember, they're being persecuted, they're suffering. Some of them were becoming followers of Jesus, and so they're sending questions back to Peter. Mm -hmm. And some of the women, in particular, were becoming Christians, and they're saying, hey, now I'm a believer, and I trust the Lord, and He's my Savior. And so it is well with my soul, but it ain't well with this dude I'm married to because he's not in, interested at all. Could we, uh, could I drop him and go check out the Christian youth group, I mean, singles group and try to <laughs> meet a nice new Christian guy? Who already loves Jesus. <laughs> That's right. And try it again. And Peter's going to write back in 1 Peter 3, 1, no, wives, in the same way, I want you to submit yourselves to your own husbands. Why? So that they might be won over without words by your behavior. In other words, he's, he's saying, okay, I know that would be easier and I know that would make sense, but that's not what I want. You are already married and that's a big commitment and you have your husband's ear, uh, maybe not on the tithing thing, but before anybody's going to ever be a tither, they're going to have to be a believer mm. um, because we won't ever want to do anything that we didn't even have a reason in the first place. So I don't, you know, I, I could give somebody something who I, if I don't love that person. Um, so he says, so let's back up and let's see if you can help them come to saving faith. Okay, let's just put the whole tithing thing on the side for a little while. Um, and let's see if you could be a winsome witness in such a way that they would say, I want to come with you. Even this past week, I was talking to a woman who, who told that very kind of story, who said her husband just wasn't wanting to join with her. I'm not talking about the tithing here. I'm just talking about the, just the Jesus, the church thing. And he was sporadic and he, you know, hit or miss, mostly miss. And, and, but she finally just said, she sat down with him and she said, okay, I can tell you're not really into this. You don't really care. It's not your thing. And I respect that. But I'm going to ask you to respect that I do love the Lord and I'm going to go to church. That's just going to be something I'm going to do. You don't have to go with me anymore. I'm not going to make you feel guilty or anything. But I want to go. So I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. And I'm going to have my own relationship with the Lord. And I said, so what happened? She said, the strangest thing happened. He, after a little while that day, he said, I think I'll go with you. And I said, well, so now what? And she said, now good things are happening in his soul. So I was like, well, look at that. So you got to back up. Let's set the money thing aside 
and let's work on the person's soul. Once a person's soul has come alive and they love the Lord and then they'll start to love the things that the Lord loves, then the generosity um, will follow. That said, I do have a, a, a sort of a parenthetical caveat. I think of um, several people that I've had meaningful conversations with, some in this church, some not, um, who have explained to me, here's how we do it in our marriage. Okay, how do you do it, they tell, uh, I ask. Well, I've said to my husband, or occasionally, not as much, but occasionally, it's the husband and the wife going the opposite direction. Um, I've said to my spouse, um, the way that we do our budgeting, I'm entrusted with this percentage or this allowance. Um, to do the food or to do the bills or, you know, whatever it is. And so with that percentage of our income, or for some people it's their own personal check. I, we both work, and so with my portion of my check, you know, it can be either which way, that person says, I'm, I'm going to be faithful in generosity. I'm going to tithe, not on your money, mm -hmm. but on, on my portion and you're still gonna have food on the table and I'm gonna trust God to, to multiply it and to make it all work out and I'll have kids, shoes for the kids and this sort of thing and, and if it's a two income family, it, uh, the same applies, but I'm gonna do this on, on the portion of the money that I'm in charge of. How does that go? Well, generally it goes very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, I think it has a lot to do with the winsome spouse mm -hmm. who's not clobbering with guilt their spouse over it but just doing it quietly and winsomely. And then the, the non-believing spouse sees that and says, well, I could argue, argue, make a much of a fuss about that. Good. Okay, so turning from our spouses to our kids, we had a question that came in um, about, is, does stewardship apply to your family? So for kids' activities or sports or education, um, are we paying for those or using money out of stewardship or selfishness? How yeah. does... Yeah, I don't know. And you had to say to... Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll find out when we stand before the Lord uh, what counted as, <laughs> as generous stewardship um, and what was multiplied in the minas uh, and what didn't. Um, I think there's two ways to look at it. On the one hand, I think of 1 Timothy 5, 8 that says anybody who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Well, now that's a pretty strong word. Mm -hmm. So that tells me, okay, you, we must be stewarding our money in such a way as to be providing for our families. And um, certainly in the context of Timothy, perhaps it, had to do with taking care of the older parents and but i don't think it it doesn't mean take care of the younger children as well you got to be providing for them they can't provide for themselves either with the shoes and the clothes and and you know some of the things i think this is where we just have to have an honest conversation with the lord like i tried to illustrate in a somewhat silly way the whole conversation i found myself in just this past week with the water thing and just where, you know, every week we're saying, okay, Lord, is this a need that my child has? I want to provide for their needs. Or is this a superfluous want mm -hmm. that the child doesn't really need? I don't really need to, to provide for them. And in fact, too much of that makes the child spoil and it gets us all out of whack. And I don't want to do that. So Lord, what is the right thing? And this is where community can help mm -hmm. us, where when you have... A uh, brother or a sister or two or three that you trust and that you're honest with that, where you can just say hey you know I'm trying to navigate is this the right thing to do with God's money or am I just buying into the system of the world and going above and beyond and overboard speak truth to me what do, what do you think in your in your own soul and I think that's where community can help us where the Lord will sometimes just kind of strike the tuning fork and there's oh my gosh am i seriously was i seriously thinking about doing that um and we'll say no nope, kiddo doesn't need this family doesn't need this on the other hand i think it is possible to ratchet that thing up so tightly uh and legalistically that 
we're not applying what First Timothy five eight mm -hmm. is saying. We're not providing what they do need. And uh, so the challenging thing whenever we talk about money is everybody wants the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Just give it to me, Pastor. What's the bottom line? How much can I have? How much can I not have? Well, see, I can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. Because if I could tell you that, then there would be no faith required in your own walk with the Lord. There would be no relationship between you and Him where you're communicating and you're, you're learning to trust Him more, like that very touching video that Megan did. Um, and that's what He wants for us to be in relationship with Him. So, it, so nobody, I can't tell you, here's your line in the same way that another person can tell me, well, here's, mm -hmm. You know, here's a line for you, because each of us are going to be held accountable for our own Mina when we stand before him. Well, I um, really enjoy the message, and I feel like when we begin to change our perception of who we are and how we're entrusted with our time and our resources, our gifts and our money, all of it from the Lord, mm -hmm. it begins to change our Really our does. hearts and our yeah. perspective and that overflows in all areas of our lives. So yeah. thanks for the message today. Sure. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.